Good morning and welcome to Pilgrim Congregational Church, United Church of Christ here in Oak Park, Illinois. I am Reverend Gloria Cox, Associate Pastor, and we are so delighted that you chose to join us on this Sunday, March 28th, Palm Sunday. We have been journeying to Lent and this week marks a special week in that journey, the beginning of Holy Week, which will be a challenging week, a, challenge, a week of reflection, a week of opportunity, a week that we will get through together. And for that reason, and so many more, we are glad that you are with us here today. And now hear our call to worship. Blessed is your coming kingdom. Today we say with gladness, Hosanna in the highest. We gather together this morning to listen, to watch, to hear your voice and respond with praise. Hosanna in the highest. We wait for you, for what we cannot describe, for a hope beyond words, for a love without measure, for a peace that surpasses understanding. Blessed is your coming kingdom. Hosanna in the highest. Good morning. My name is Joyce Lynn Fowler, and I am honored to be your liturgist this morning. Please join me in an attitude of prayer as we move into the opening prayer. Dear God, thank you for sending your son and paving the way for our lives. Thank you for what this day stands for, the beginning of Holy Week, the start of the journey towards the cross, and the victory of the resurrection. Hosanna, 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We give you praise for your ways are righteous and true. We will declare that your love stands firm forever. For your love and kindness endures forever. Thank you that your ways are far greater than our ways. Your thoughts far deeper than our thoughts. Thank you for making all things new. Thank you for you hear our prayers and you know our hearts. Help us to stay strong and true to you. Help us not to follow the voice of the crowds, but to hear your whispers and to seek after you. We praise you and bless you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we amen. amen. Now, please join Janine Bergen in singing the opening hymn, All Glory, Lord, and Honor. And now, please join me in our call to confession. Let us confess our sins to God, whose steadfast love endures forever. We confess that we have sinned, and although we would like to deny it, we have forsaken you. We are horrified by the suffering we cause to you, ourselves, and the world you crave. Open the gates of your forgiveness and restore us in your love. For the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, hear the good news. The Lord God helps us. We will not be disgraced. The Lord God helps us. Who can declare us guilty? Sisters and brothers, beyond the shadow of a doubt, your sins are forgiven. By the mercy of Christ, let us stand together, forgiven and free. Sunday Pilgrim. On this beautiful sunny day, I wish you the peace of Christ and the love of God. Peace be with you all. Peace, peace, peace be with you now 
and always. And this morning, our Old Testament reading is from Psalm 118, verses 1 to 2, and 19 to 29, from the New Revised Standard Version. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is good, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today is a very special day on our Latin journey. Here we have traveled and we're up to Palm Sunday. Now why am I holding up my hand like this? Because this is our palm. And normally we would be gathered together in worship in our sanctuary and we would have palms that were handed out that we would be able to wave. But since we're at home and not together, we all have one of these. So wave out that palm on this Palm Sunday. But today I'm going to focus on the other featured scripture, which is Psalm 118, specifically verse 24. And it has something to do with this. Hmm, a head of lettuce. What could it have to do with that? Well, we will see. Here's our scripture for today. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us See, let us rejoice and be happy in it today. Well, let's name some kind of days. How many different kinds of days are there? Like birthdays, school days, snow days. Field trip day was my favorite when I was in school because You'd be going to a really special destination on the bus. And usually I had a special lunch that I would have with a special treat in it. So field trip day was a great day. But are all days good days? No, unfortunately not. There's sick days. There's sad days. There's rainy days. There's days when we just aren't happy, right? But what our scripture is telling us today is, it, we have it within our control. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. In the scripture, God is saying it's our choice. Let us decide how we're going to accept this day, whether it's good or bad. To be able to see that God has created this special day for us. And there's always something that we can rejoice and be glad in. Even on the most unhappiest days we can see that God has created a wonderful world for us and it is our choice, let us, our choice, to decide how we're going to see that day. Even on that special day as Jesus entered into the city and all the townspeople were lined up, waving their palms, 
greeting him there, what loomed ahead was sadness, death, the unknown, just around the corner. But they chose to rejoice and be glad in that day that God had given them. Let us pray. Dear God, let us rejoice and be glad because you have given us the choice to see the wonders that you have created around us in each and every day. Even the days that bring us sadness and sorrow, we can still see those things that we can rejoice and be glad in each and every day. Amen. Our second scripture reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. I'll be reading from the Common English Bible translation. When Jesus and his followers approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. Jesus gave two disciples a task, saying to them, Go into that village over there. As soon as you enter it, you will find tied up there a colt that no one has ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, Its master needs it, and he will send it back right away. They went, found a colt tied to a gate outside on the street, and they untied it. Some people standing around said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them just what Jesus said, and they left them alone. They brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes upon it, and he sat on it. Many people spread out their clothes on the road, while others spread branches cut from the fields. Those in front of him and those following were shouting, Hosanna! Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And after he looked around at everything, because it was already late in the evening, he returned to Bethany with the twelve. This is a word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. When I was growing up, my family didn't really observe Lent in any formal way. Of course, I noticed that several of my friends had smudges of ash on their foreheads on Ash Wednesday, but our family didn't do that. We also didn't give up anything for Lent or eat fish on Fridays. Probably the closest thing to a Lent tradition that we observed was Mardi Gras, because my dad's family had moved from Mississippi to Louisiana when he was a young adult, and every year my relatives from New Orleans sent us boxes of trinkets from the Mardi Gras parades and a king's cake. It was always a treat to get this box of goodies from my cousins, although I must admit I was an adult before I realized that most of the trinkets had been rescued from the streets where they had been thrown from the Mardi Gras parade floats. So from one perspective, it was actually rubbish. But even after I figured that out, I still looked forward to it because it made us feel like we had been part of the celebrating crowd, even though we were miles away. The spirit of Mardi Gras was a point of connection that our family could share across generations and geography. Somehow, our celebration of Fat Tuesday never really connected to the solemnness of Ash Wednesday or Lent, though. It wasn't part of my mom and dad's church tradition, and it wasn't something that was emphasized in the UCC church that I grew up in. What we did celebrate, though, was Palm Sunday. I distinctly remember waving palms with wild abandon in the sanctuary and having the palm sword fights later in the fellowship hall after church. Other than the Christmas pageant, it was the most fun a kid could have during worship. I also remember the celebratory hymns and anthems sung with enthusiasm and seemingly a bit louder than our regular hymns. It was like a preview of Easter, but without the need to dress up and without the candy. 
Before we could actually get to Easter, of course, we had to journey through the unpleasantness of Holy Week. I was more aware of the events of Holy Week than Lent, but my understanding was still pretty simplistic and probably as much influenced by movies as scripture. Jesus receives a hero's welcome when he arrives in Jerusalem, a parade in which his fans celebrate that he has come to liberate them from the oppression of the foreign government that is making their lives miserable. But over the course of the week, Jesus doesn't live up to their expectations, and he angers that government's leaders and religious authorities, so the crowds turn on him. And when given a choice, they select another prisoner to go free, thus condemning Jesus to death by crucifixion. Of course, I now realize that the story is a lot more nuanced. And in fact, each of the Gospels tells it a bit differently, emphasizing different aspects of Jesus' ministry and evidence of God's faithfulness to God's people, tailoring the message to make it most relevant for their early Christian audiences. And in that spirit, I invite you today to join me in a closer look at the way the Gospel of Mark tells the story of Palm Sunday and to reflect on how this ancient story might have relevant insights for us still today. Since the focus on Palm Sunday is on Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, it's helpful to start there with Jerusalem. Jerusalem was not just any city. By the first century, it had been the center of the sacred geography of the Jewish people for a millennium. But its associations were both positive and negative. It was the city of God and the faithless city, the city of hope and the city of oppression. Jerusalem became the capital of ancient Israel in the time of King David, and under David and his son Solomon, Israel experienced the greatest period in its history. David's reign was not only a time of power and glory, but also of justice and righteousness. David became associated with goodness, power, protection, and justice. He was the apple of God's eye. Some even thought he was God's son. But after King David, things changed. And for many, the changes were for the worse. In the decades after Rome took control of the Jewish homeland, Jerusalem became the center of a political, economic, and social system that was characterized by opp oppression and exploitation. The few, the powerful, and the wealthy dominated the political system, and ordinary people had no voice in shaping their society. A high percentage of society's wealth went into the coffers of a small percentage of the population. And the temple, God's house, was at the center. The temple authorities, priestly and lay, came from wealthy families. The temple was the center of both local and the imperial tax system. And records of debt were stored at the temple. This is the Jerusalem that Jesus entered on Palm Sunday, along with tens of thousands of Jewish pilgrims journeying to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. Particularly conscious of God as the one who liberates people, God who vanquished their oppressor in Egypt, God who brought them safely out to the promised land. Their faith brought them to this place, encouraged by the messianic promise of a better future. But Roman occupation and oppressive religious leadership would remind them of how far their current reality was from the glory days of Kings David and Solomon. The integration of Jewish Palestine into the Roman Empire had brought about the commercialization of agriculture and with it a dramatic rise in the number of large landholders. Peasants were forced off their ancestral land and landless peasants had few options. Day labor, immigration, working on building projects in the city, begging, Life as a peasant had always been meager, but it had been adequate. 
Now for many, it no longer was. Jesus was from the peasant village of Nazareth and his followers came from the peasant class. They had journeyed to Jerusalem from Galilee about a hundred miles to the north. And as the author of Gospel of Mark tells the story, Jesus has a very specific and prearranged plan for his entrance into the city. He approaches from the east, gives two of his disciples instructions to get a specific colt for him to ride. And then surrounded by a crowd of enthusiastic followers and sympathizers who spread their cloaks and throw leafy branches on the ground while shouting, Hosanna, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. He approaches the city. At the same time that an imperial procession was happening on the opposite side of the city, in which Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Adumea, Judea, and Samaria, enters Jerusalem from the west, at the heart of a column of imperial cavalry and soldiers. Pilate's military procession was a demonstration of both Roman imperial power and Roman imperial theology. It was designed to preemptively prevent trouble during a festival that celebrated the Jewish people's liberation from earlier empires. Jesus' counter procession, in which the peasant crowd shouts, Hosanna, please save us, save us now, begins to bear more resemblance to a planned political demonstration than a celebratory parade. An action that is just as spontaneous as it is planned. Perhaps similar to marches and protests that many of us have participated in, it is loud, vibrant, and beautiful. A breathing organism in itself. Throughout the passage, we have hints that Jesus himself is the orchestrator of this action, but that others are certainly going along with him. Certainly, there are some in the crowd that simply find themselves there. That happened to Bruce and I once when we were leaving an event downtown Chicago. As we were walking to the L, we realized we'd inadvertently joined a crowd that was actually a protest march. It was a cause for something that made sense to us, so we joined in and journeyed with them until we got to our destination. There were likely also some in the crowd who were there because they had heard of Jesus' ministry and didn't want to miss out on what others had experienced in his presence. Maybe they wanted to see firsthand what all the fuss was about. Or maybe they wanted to be able to tell the story, to say, I was there. I'm sure that there were those in the crowd that fit the description I'd always imagined of the crowd. The ones who were excited about Jesus when they thought he was going to win by fighting power with power, but then turned on him when they didn't meet his expectations. But the most interesting and perhaps important ones in the crowd were those who cried Hosanna. The ones who were looking for a miracle, the ones whose lives were in peril and there were for were asking even pleading to be saved. Perhaps Hosanna for them is less of a cheer and more of a declaration of an urgent cry for help to God, expressed as praise in the confidence that God hears, cares, and responds. What I always thought of almost like a parade could almost be seen as a nonviolent direct action demonstration. And the meaning of the demonstration is clear because it uses symbols from the prophet Zechariah, from the Hebrew scriptures. According to Zechariah, a king would be coming to Jerusalem, humble and riding on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And this king, riding on a donkey, will banish war from the land. No more chariots, war horses, or bows. No more imperial army. No more impression and injustice. He will be a king of peace. As Mark retells the story, the end of the procession is extremely anticlimactic. There are no speeches or dramas. The crowd even seems to disband before they even enter the city, leaving Jesus to enter Jerusalem alone. He checks out the temple 
and then retires for the evening to the nearby town where he is staying with his disciples. There he prepares to come back the next day and confront the authorities at the temple, calling them out for their hypocrisy and faithlessness, speaking truth to power. Basically causing the type of trouble that Pilate's procession was trying to prevent. As Mark tells the story, the celebration doesn't happen on Palm Sunday. In fact, there aren't even palms, just leafy branches, because perhaps because palms in the ancient world were thought to be symbols of victory. There cannot be victory until power has been confronted on the behalf of the oppressed. The marginalized, those that society has deemed as less worthy because they are less wealthy. One of the lessons that Mark's gospel emphasizes is that when one boldly confronts power and calls it to repent, one will suffer the consequences because power is rarely freely given up. And those activists who prove too great a threat to the status quo will be punished. Attempts will be made to silence them and the movements they inspire. We see this in the story of Holy Week. But the good news, in fact, the great news is that this isn't the end of the story. Today's Psalm, Psalm 118, gives us a glimpse of how it will end. The psalmist in that, in that psalm has been threatened, challenged, rejected, and nearly defeated on the field of battle. But this is a song of thanksgiving and praise to God because the psalmist has not only survived, he thrived. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, implies that he has moved from a state of rejection to a position of prominence. Thanks to God, his story has a happy ending, although where the ways of God are involved, things do not always turn out the way people expect. Now Psalm 118 should not be read as a prophetic prediction of Jesus, but there is an analogy to be found in both. God worked to elevate and exalt the lowly and the threatened to a place of prominence. And although in each case the lowly had to move through oppression and opposition, they were not overtaken by death, literal or otherwise. And so like the psalmist, we give thanks to the Lord for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever and will sustain us as we follow Jesus to the cross and beyond helping us to face our fears and find our voice, encouraging us to use our power to empower and seek justice for all, this week and every week. Amen.
I now invo invite you to join me in a time of prayer. You are welcome to share your joys and concerns in the chat on YouTube Live. I do remind you that it is a public chat. Today's prayers are responsive, and so when I say, Lord, hear our prayer, you are invited to respond at home with, and in your love, answer. And when I call on us to pray for those in need, I invite you to speak their names aloud, wherever you are, or to type it in the chat. Let us pray together. Most holy and merciful God, you know that we sometimes long to hide. We long to hide from suffering and pain, even change. We long to hide from you sometimes, God, out of our busyness, out of our shame, out of being consumed with ourselves, and maybe out of no real reason at all. We long to ignore the things happening in our city and nation, things which are so difficult and complex to face. Help us to stand in the light of your presence which casts out fear. Grant to us strength for the journey ahead. Lord, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. We pray for courage, O oh God. We pray to be people of the truth in the midst of a society that likes to tell lies. We are continually tempted to believe that some are better than others because of the color of of their skin. We feel the weight of this lie on our chest, O oh God. It is sometimes hard to breathe. We are tempted to believe that our security can ma be maintained through violence and weapons of war that guns will save us from fear of one another, from the fear of what is different. This is also a lie. Help us to see the truth, to be people who say no to killing and death in all its forms, and to live into the fullness of your beloved community Lord, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. We pray for our sisters and brothers in Brazil, where hospitals are near collapse, and there are reports of spiking COVID-19 case numbers. We ask for your presence in India, where they also are seeing a significant increase in infections as they mark the biggest case rise increase since November. We pray for the people of Somalia as COVID-19 surges and deaths are reported. Lord, hear our prayer and in your love answer. And yes, God, we also just pray simply for help. Help us, oh God. The truth is, is that we don't really know what we need. We do not know how to be healed or move forward, or what actions are best to do next, 
what will bring about the change that we need. If we knew, we would do it. We don't. We don't know. We seek your face and we trust in the power of your love for us. That you know far better than we do what we truly need. So help us, oh God. Lord, hear our prayer. And in your love, answer. And hear us now, O oh God, as we name before you those we bear in our hearts today. We lift up those in pain and in need of care. Kathy. Drew. Carol. Sally, Chal, Victor, Jen, Justin, Lindsay, God, we lift up these beloved people to you. We pray that you would help them and heal them. We pray that your spirit would bring them peace. We pray that your love would fall down gently upon them, that they would know that they belong to you and are beloved. Lord, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. And now, hear us, O God, as we pray the prayer your Son, Jesus, taught us, praying with whatever words are most comfortable to us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. This is a time in our service that we offer to God a portion of what God has given to us. You are invited to give to Pilgrim Congregational Church using any of these methods. Online at www.pilgrimoakpark.org select given from the menu or click the give to pilgrim button via the tidely t-i-t-h-e dot l-y app downloaded from your phone's app store text the word give to 833-721-1111 you can always mail a check to the church. At this time, we ask that you give as generously as you are able.
And now we dedicate our gifts in prayer. Their Lord, the crowds offered you their coats to walk on. They waved palm branches, honoring your presence. Today we honor you, Lord, with our faithful tithes and offerings. We give you these gifts with gratitude and joy, thankful that you are God over all. May we use these gifts for the betterment of your world. Amen. And now it's time for announcements. We are encouraging everyone to get the vaccine as soon as possible if you are eligible. The Village of Oak Park has great resources available if you have questions about the different vaccines, when and where to get the shots. For your convenience, we have added a link to that information on our website. It's right on the front page. Please help spread the word and encourage those you know to get the vaccine. For Good Friday this year, which is this Friday, in case you didn't know, we are going to have an in-person worship opportunity. You will be able to walk through the Stations of the Cross in our lovely building. We will have a little path for you to take through the building. The Stations can be viewed in small groups between 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. as an open house format to allow safety for everyone. You do, however, need to register for an in-person viewing. You can do so by going to our website. It is on the front page of our website in the right box. Additionally, the stations, along with special music offerings, will also premiere on our YouTube channel at 7 p.m. on Good Friday. So if you don't feel comfortable coming to the building, which we certainly understand, you can watch the service on YouTube Live. A reminder that the Pilgrim uh, Anti-Racism Be Bold group has drafted an anti-racism pledge. Pilgrim members and friends are encouraged to read it, to pray about it, to consider signing it as a personal commitment. I would encourage you to sign it. More information and the pledge can be found again on the front page of our website. There are still a few spots left in the score committee's new white caucus group. Karen Grimes and Kirsten Peachy will be facilitating a five session discussion of the book Practice Showing Up, a guidebook for white people working for racial justice by Jardana Peacock. The sessions will be held from 6 to 7.30 p.m. on the following Sundays. It starts April 18th and goes until May 23rd, skipping May 9th. Please email Karen Grimes to ask questions or to express your interest in participating. Her email address can be found in the directory. And please join Bobby Hald and I for our weekly service of evening prayer it's every Tuesday from 8 to 8.30. It's a really lovely opportunity to reflect and obviously to pray uh, and to, to end the day in the presence of God and one another. I hope to see you there. And immediately following today's service, everyone is invited to join us for a brief time of virtual fellowship on Zoom. And now, please join us in singing the closing hymn, all hail King Jesus.
And now, my friends, as we prepare to fully enter Holy Week and all of the challenges and opportunities that brings with us, go into this week knowing that you are blessed, that you are loved, and with the courage to meet all of the challenge that comes with that. In Jesus' name, amen.